Hi. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for another one of the library's Author of the Month um, program. And we're so happy to have with us this morning, Miss Barbara Arundel. I'm sure a lot of us have heard Miss Arundel or know about Miss Arundel. And, you know, she always has a wealth of information with her. And so we are happy to have her as the library's author of the month for the month of May. Welcome, Miss Arundel, to our program. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I've watched a few of these before, so I'm honored to be now the, the author sitting with you. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. So for those listening, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, uh, my name is Barbara Arundel. I, I manage the best of books. I am always interested in youth development and uh, projects that will benefit the young people in whatever way. I think of myself as somebody who is uh, aware of the environment. So I will often push things like encouraging people to plant trees and encouraging children to remind their parents not to litter. <laughs> And of course, uh, reading and writing are part of my passions, as well as history. I, I love knowing more about the past. I would almost call that a bit of a, not quite an obsession, but something that definitely gets me going. So my, my writing, not that much my published writing has it, but my writing, the one that I enjoy, tend to be about historical events. I like writing historical fiction. So, for example, the, the book that's called um, The Legend of Bat's Cave and Other Stories, it's basically taking moments of history and creating a story around it, whether the story be totally true or not. You know, <laughs> I have two other bits of work in progress right now that are surrounding Antiguan history, you know, because that, that's what I like to write. And I also enjoy having other people write that as well. So... More recently, I've started doing some uh, some creative writing sessions via Zoom, and I've been having fun, both a teen group as well as an adult group. And yeah, we're all having fun writing crazy things um, once a week and sharing them with each other. Not sure if that told you who I am, but those are the things that I'm interested in. <laughs> <laughs> well, it tells us about you. Me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. But, uh yeah but um so have you always been interested in like writing i tell you what i'll tell you a couple of, of childhood memories one was that i might have been about maybe six or seven i remember as adults tend to do somebody asking what do you want to be when you grow up and i remember saying i want to be an author i don't know why a six or seven year old would choose that word but for some reason i learned the word so I said, I want to be an author. My brother, who's five years older than I am, who might be listening on this chat, I don't know. But I remember him pulling me aside later and telling me very in a very serious way, and he probably wouldn't remember this. But he said to me, you don't want to be an author. All authors end up poor, living in a cold cottage like Ian Blyton. And so oh my then, goodness. I have no idea where he got that story from or why he said it to me. But it had an impact. I mean, I had to rethink this whole thing now because my big brother was telling me, no, you don't want to be an author. <laughs> but writing was always something that was, was there for me. Uh, I've never been a good speller. So then the other, other story I'll share is that my great aunt, her name was Vivian, Vivian Lake. She was a teacher. She taught in a number of, of schools, including the Antigua Girls School and uh, in Freemansville. But she came to our home every Saturday for lunch. And part of the ritual was that I had to show her my work for the, the week, you know, bring out all the exercise books. And whereas nice. my teachers were, were, no, it wasn't nice. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> whereas my teachers enjoyed my, my short story writing because I was considered to be doing really well with that. I was creative. And V would tear it apart because she would find every spelling mistake I made and, you know, all the grammatical mistakes and the things that as far as she was concerned, I don't know how this is going to sound, but she would say, having been a teacher in the public school system and obviously been very much 
public versus private in her thinking. Or are your parents wasting this money sending you off to, to Catholic school and these Catholic school teachers can't even see where you make these spelling mistakes. And so it was torture on Saturdays when she would go through my exercise books because teachers are saying, job well done, very nice story. And my aunt, my great aunt is telling me, this is just not good enough. <laughs> oh dear. But I'm sure that helps. I Looking back. I suppose <laughs> the fact is that I did have an issue with spelling. I, I, I figured out much later on in life that it was in fact a, an issue that, you know, had I lived somewhere else, I might have been taught how to, to, to spell properly. But my brain doesn't work in such a way that I, I spell the way everybody else does. So no matter how often I see certain words, I still can't figure out how to spell them, you know? And I, I got around that by writing good stories. So that the teachers <laughs> seem to like the sticks, except for my great aunt, but there. <laughs> <laughs> okay um I, I i read that you're also a playwright <laughs> well thank you yes I, I, I didn't know <laughs> i have written two full-length plays probably more than that but i mean two that i will speak of i guess the the more well-known one was called dreams faces reality and it's dreams comma, or dot, 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 faces, dot, 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 reality. Oh, and It okay. was, as opposed to what people think, which is dreams are facing realities. Yes. But it was looking at the different faces and the various dreams and the realities of people who are living with HIV AIDS. Oh. And this was written probably over 20 years ago, inspired by uh, my involvement in the Optimist Club and a, a wonderful person in Barbados whose name is uh, Dr. Carol Jacob Haynes, who was at that time challenging us to do more work in terms of HIV awareness, uh, particularly in terms of discrimination. And so my club wanted to do something and I decided I could write a play. And well, it would have been my second full-length play that I did with the club. But we performed this piece and it really looked more at the discrimination not at the illness but the way people were treating this young man who looked absolutely fine we showed how his life changed how his parents started to question his sexuality question his father you know started speaking of him as not his son anymore because uh -huh. you know, if you have this illness then you must be this you know okay. whether the young man was or not which is to me relevant uh -huh. but uh, and so you sort of went through the emotional roller coaster of somebody who, just by doing a routine uh, medical exam, found out he was HIV positive, but all of a sudden, everybody in his life had to experience discrimination. And again, the story was written over 20 years ago. So I think hopefully things have changed a bit in terms of our thinking. But we performed the play as an adult club, I think twice. Then we had junior optimist clubs at that point in time. And we performed, we had them perform it, including a trip, two trips, a trip to Barbuda and a trip to Anguilla. And in Anguilla, uh, I, can, I can almost say the date that was done. Uh, it was in August of, of 19 years ago. And they performed twice in Anguilla. And, you know, it, that, that was a good experience. We took these young people down there, you know, it's called a big field trip, but they performed. And then at some point in time, the, the Christian Council here, through Mrs. Amer, decided it was a good tool. And they funded us getting a smaller cast. I think it was four to six young people. And we put on various scenes of this at the Dean William Lake Cultural Center. And various schools around Antigua, easily 20 schools or more, were brought in one at a time because a school fills that auditorium. Right. You know? And so they performed it over and over and over again. And then there would be discussions with the, the students in terms of, you know, all that was going on. So I, I would want to say that that's probably one of the, the plays that's been performed in this wonderful country of ours uh, very, very often. And, yeah, I didn't realize that somebody said to me, you know, I don't think any other, other play has been performed this many times. And I thought, I'm sure there must have been. <laughs> but... <laughs> It is interesting. We even took it into churches where we would take one scene and perform it uh, in place of a sermon. Uh, about maybe 
six or eight churches, some churches didn't like the idea back then of bringing HIV to their church, um, <laughs> which of course just shows you why it was needed. But yeah, so there was that play. I've rambled on about dreams, faces, reality. <laughs> I would love sounds, to actually have it in a book form. I'd love to have it in a book yes. form, spoken yes. about that often, so it could be utilized perhaps in the school systems. But we, we, we writers often talk about doing writing projects and you know <laughs> the rest of life takes over. Right. The other play was about uh, Prince Class and it was called Simply Call Me Class. And so, you know, again, my love of history, I had the opportunity of going to the museum and finding the, the, the transcripts of the, the court case uh, where they you know, brought these many men to trial and I found out more about the story of this man that we call court or class. Um, I'm told in more recent times that his legal name was court, so call him court. Yes. And so I was able to, to try to bring him to life. I think that's what my historical fiction does. You know, I, I try to, to not just have these people as somebody who did something on a particular day, but to remind us there were people who had lives. Individ right. They were individuals, right? What were they doing? You know, we, we knew that that, that um, King Court was somebody who was trusted. You know, we we're told he was able to wear the finest clothes. So I wanted to see you know, what would life have been like? What, what, let's get into his head. What was he thinking? <laughs> you know, and I even wrote a piece more recently. Uh, Petra Williams had actually asked me to write a piece for a publication she was associated with. And I, I imagined the young man uh, just arriving into Antigua. And I went into his head and, and you know, got some of his thoughts <laughs> or what I think his thoughts would be. <laughs> That's the kind of writing I like because, again, it brings the person to life. Yes, so, yes. A historic figure reminding us we're all people. They were people too. That's that, that's very interesting. Right. Okay. So um, let's get back to some of your books. You've done Antigua, My Antigua. That's, that's your coloring book. That's the yes. color. <laughs> yes. And this was done in association with Edison Library. There's actually a painting right behind me. If I yes. don't know go this way. <laughs> and this is one of Edison's uh, paintings. And I have a few of his paintings from my home. I, I love his work. And so we came together to put this book together. So, you know, the words are mine. The, and what it does is it takes you on a tour, basically, of Antigua. And so in this book, children will color the cathedral. They will color the fruits, a mango, a pineapple, you know, the things you'll find at the market. Uh, they will go to uh, Boggy Peak, Mount Obama. I'm not sure which is the current name that we're using. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have a fisherman throwing his net out to sea. You know, you visit the dockyard. You see the lady who is uh, frying or, or roasting corn on the side of the road. Wow. Very Antiguan scenes, you know. Yeah. Then, then we end with one of my favorite um, pastimes. A cricket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no visit to Antigua or no discussion about Antigua and Barbuda should be without cricket, without cricket in my humble yes. opinion. And so, you know, but the book starts with basically tourists arriving at either the airport, um, either the airport or at the harbor. And you basically, again, you see the different things that that a person can do when they visit Antigua. And of course, not just visit, but those of us who live here. Because yes. so many of us don't know our own island. True. And True. I, having said that, I want to encourage us all to also get to know Barbuda, because Barbuda is a fantastic place. And I've written a couple of stories about Barbuda. Uh, at least one has been published uh, in an online um journal or something. <laughs> uh, but I think the Barbudan history is amazing. I am of Barbudan, um, I have Barbudan roots. My great grandfather would have been Barbudan and at least two or three generations before him. So, you know, to me, that's home as well. It's that's all, <laughs> all one country. Interesting. But I think not enough of us enjoy Barbuda and understand the, the value of that wonderful little island next door. I think we learned a bit about that. I personally have never been to Barbuda. <laughs> oh, no, don't tell me that. I've never been to Barbuda. But you need to organize a, a library tour and get everybody from the library over to Barbuda. 
Yes, because um, at one point in time, the library did um, summer programs in Barbuda. Okay. But from the time I came to work here, that was it. So you're you're telling me that it might be your fault. That, that, I'm wondering because <laughs> from the time I, because I was looking forward to the next one and it never happened. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm known to bug people with certain things. So now that you've not been, I might every now and again send you a message and ask if you're planning a tour because probably <laughs> we probably you know, need to do that. Go, go to a place, go experience it for yourself. I mean stand on a beach and not see the end of it because it's so it's 17 miles long where else can you do that in in the world almost you know and it's just across the water and mm -hmm. depending on if you like boating or if you like you prefer the plane i personally prefer the sea uh it's a wonderful ride across so you can enjoy that part of it and then you can see the amazing frigate birds and the entire bird sanctuary and that so much I'd more. Love to see. that i'd love to see that i'd love to see because from staff's recount, I mean, you know, the and the programs went well there, and they enjoyed going over there. Right. You know, right. so I really looked forward to that. But I okay. think that that will be <laughs> the next few months, so you guys can start working on it right now. You know, uh, I will send you a message. <laughs> There's teachers over there who would gladly work with you to to do something. Because yes. you know, once sure. again, you're going to be hooked, and you'll want to go back, and you'll want to take more children over there and to work along with the children in Barbuda even more. That'd be great. That'd be great. All right. Yeah. So I love that book. Um, you know, it'd be nice if like primary schools and preschoolers would you utilize that. Antigua my Antigua? Yes. That's an excellent <laughs> thing for them to use. For independence or or Black History Month. You know, you find a teacher or two who will send their students to get it. But I would love to see various preschools just have it as one of yes, the. I think so. Because it's a learning tool as well. It it's fun. Is, it learning is. Is fun. Yes. Is learning about your, your country. Fun as True. Well. I, I agree 100%. And then there's the legend of Batcave and other stories. Yes. That one I find very interesting. <laughs> All right. So here we have it. And. It's right now made up of three stories. There, there are plans to uh, increase it to five stories. We will see what happens. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I think it is my little book, and it needs to be perhaps. There, there are so many other short stories that I've written before and since that, to me, it makes sense perhaps to maybe give you access to more than three of the stories. But, you know, the I think the first story written in terms of these three stories is as you mentioned when we were chatting the more personal one and it's called chasing horses and it's basically the story of of my my grandmother and her siblings or her, her family and how life changed for her uh in in the, in the blink of an eye so if you would let me i will read just a couple of, of paragraphs and you can always give me a signal if I've read, i'm reading too much <laughs> but um Yes. So moving forward, it says, so I'm reading almost towards the end of the story, okay. right? If anybody wants to get the full story, they have to come and, and buy the book. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> we will have copies available at the best of books within about 10 days because it is being okay. reprinted. Okay. All right. So she was a fifth form student with only months needed to complete her secondary education, but that was never to be. Arthur did hire another driver and Maud was soon enrolled at the Antigua Girls High School. With her brother, she made the trek in the buggy every morning and afternoon, having lunch at her cousin's home in Corn Alley. The Anglican nuns and other teachers often told her that she was a bad girl, nothing at all like her older sister. And at times she thought about doing something really bad. They would tell her not to come back to school. She decided against that as Irene threatened to send her to Miss Robb's school. And everyone knew that Miss Robb believed firmly that to spare the rod was to spoil the child. Maud would bide her time at the Antigua Girls High School. The lessons were never a problem. She easily finished the silly sums that they gave her. And when they realized that she was ahead of the other 11 students in her class, they moved her up to a higher form. It didn't matter. She still finished the work with time to spare, time to spend planning her experiments 
and designing new games that she would play with her friends in the evening when she got home. That, of course, is if that slave driver of a sister would allow her to go outside. <laughs> That's just a, you know, a paragraph or two there. Um, would you want me to go on or do we want to chat about something else? Uh, well, one more. Can we have one more? <laughs> one more. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. It was awful. The house was always spotless now and she had to take her shoes off at the door. Irene always complained about how she looked, the way she packed her bag, the way she made her bed. It was one thing hearing how bad she was at school, but her home used to be a fun place. She tried talking to Pappy about it, but he just told her that Irene was doing her best and simply wanted to be sure that she, Maud, grew into a proper young lady. I'm gonna jump forward and say that Bertie was sitting next to her, to Maud, in the buggy on the way home. And although they were not speaking to each other, they were having the same thoughts. He felt as though he'd lost everything. He'd lost his mother. She was in the cemetery at St. Peter's. He knew how that had happened. What he didn't understand was what had happened to his sister, his friend. She had simply disappeared. Pappy shouldn't have allowed her to stop or to drop out of school. School had been important to Irene. He knew that, and his father should have known that also. So in a way, the story is really about a, a young girl having to become a woman overnight because her mother dies. You know, and although her mother had been sick, I suppose none of us ever expect death, so to speak. And so the story basically is, the story begins with a, a carefree teenage girl riding horses. The story is called Chasing Horses chasing horses with her brother from Parham to St. John's Botanical Gardens. And when they are on their way home, their father meets them with the bad news that their mother is oh, wow. ill. Anyway, I'm not giving you the whole story. Yes, but yes, the yes. Is that everything changes and you see how it changes for all of them. From the, the naughty sister, sister who they used to leave alone because she was running wild and happier playing with the other children who lived around to the, the eldest sister who now has to become the woman of the house. And, mm. uh, you know, I ended off telling you about these three people and uh, Bertie, as he's called in the story, became Dr. Lake, who became the, the doctor for St. Kitts Nevis and Anguilla and other places at that point. Oh, in time. Lake. You know, and Irene, who had had dreams of becoming a doctor herself, had to give oh, up right. her dreams because she was a woman and expected to take care of everybody. And, and had promised her mother on her deathbed that she would make Bertie become a doctor, you know? So again, it's also looking at the way things were at a particular point in time, you know, that your yes. responsibility as the big sister was not to further yourself, but to make sure your younger brother yeah, sure. became what dying yes. mom wants him to become. So. That was then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope it's changed. It's changed to some degree, right? We're not too sure if it's changed, it has. but it's changed. Well, some yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, you had me like going along. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. So there's another book. You have a Nancy? Uh, I, no, I don't have a Nancy book. No. <laughs> I, I, yes or no? You, you wrote that? You. I, 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 I actually have three stories written and they are the stories of Mrs. Anansi. So my story is that all of you think that Anansi was the really smart spider. The reality is his wife was the one who gave him all those good ideas. <laughs> all right. So, and these stories have been sitting on my computer for oh, years. Oh, wow. And um, even one of them is fully illustrated. I paid someone to illustrate it. And I haven't gotten any further than that. Um, and there's a friend of mine probably listening right now who's shaking her head because she's always encouraging me to, to get that done. I mean, I, I, it's the only thing I've ever really planned in terms of writing. So after writing the first one, I decided it should be a collection of about 10 different Anansi stories. And I wrote out a plan. I know what they should all be. I've completed three of the stories. The others are all in, in bits and pieces. And I really have not visited with uh, Mrs. Anansi all the children, the children all have names. Uh, their names are Ade, Arthur, and Alexander. Yep, I remember. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
And um, yeah, at some point I would like to get that that published somehow, somewhere. So but, we, we have we have that to look forward to. We have that Probably. to look forward to. You know, awesome. it, would, it would be great if we lived in a place as, as was at one point where, you know, uh, our writers could somehow find funding to just write and be recognized as contributors to society through their writing as opposed to having to, you know, eco out your living as well as write part-time. But that, yeah, yes. awesome thing. But that, that is part of, of the challenge, really, you know, and um, perhaps more support in, in many quarters on the island as well. True. You know, I often get, uh, I get invited to things in other islands quite often or that sort of thing, and we see opportunities. I'd love to see more opportunities in Antigua and Barbuda. But that said, we still move forward and we still keep writing. And um, yes. <laughs> I would also like to see more opportunities like that in Antigua and Barbuda. I'd also like to take this time to congratulate you on that book, Turtle Beat. <laughs> you got into the Collins Big Cat series. Yes, I did. Thank you. <laughs> and you and Miss Hillhouse, I mean, that was so awesome. And well, I'm so proud of you guys. The third person from Antigua who is in the series now, Desiree Collins, uh, she works in the Ministry of Education and she has a book called How to Write a Calypso. And that's just been published through the, 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 the same series of books. The, um, so, you know, she's somebody else you to speak to. Oh, wow. I, I don't so it have seems as if once you guys got in there, you got in there. Yeah, you know, this is something that we've been working towards for a long time. The the Collins Big Cat series is, is, is a huge series. And as, as, as an associate of Collins, you know, one of the challenges for me was trying to convince people in our region to use them without them being linked to us. And so, I mean, I always want to see us have more books that represent us in various ways. Our stories, the way we look, all of that. Yeah. And so many of us, we would go to Collins conferences and we would discuss the idea of Caribbean big cat books. And so at some point a few years ago, they they got the go ahead to, to start. And yes, you know, we in Antigua threw out names of Antiguan authors who <laughs> would be perfect. And I mean, there, there are books, of course, from around the region, different types of books. The first, I believe it's probably about seven have been published so far. And of course, there have been delays through this situation that we're all living through. Mm -hmm. uh, even Turtle Beach, for example, you know, uh, it should have been released in Canada since uh, last month, I believe. A close friend of mine received hers on Sunday evening, so at least I know that they are now in Canada. And but shipping is crazy around the world, and we just have to be um, aware and live with what we have. And the book is available in the UK. It's available in Antigua. I know that some the bookstore in Barbados has ordered, so my, my, my Bajan friends will soon be able to order it there or to get it there. Awesome. Hopefully other Caribbean territories will, will follow suit. I hope they'll also have the jungle outside because Joanne's book is fantastic. Yes, it They're is. From similar age groups. And you know, as she would have said when you spoke with her, you know, just the idea that when you look at you look at the books, again you see us. Yes. You know? And you see situations that, that look like us. Uh, Zabi and Archibald, who illustrated the book, is also Antiguan. So for me, you know, my, my sort of big up is that my book is completely Antiguan and Barbudan. That's awesome. <laughs> Author and illustrator from this, from this rock. And I think she did a brilliant job illustrating it. I love it. She got my thoughts. She got the movement of, of our people, you know. And, and yeah, I, I like the book. I hope everybody else does too. <laughs> Well, you're a great storyteller and author, so I'm sure that everybody will enjoy that book also. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Before we went live, we were discussing um, publishing. Mm -hmm. And is it the first two books that you did that... Um, Self-published. Okay. <laughs> you, see, you see, I was hesitated, right? <laughs> Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Which basically means that, so basically it means I paid for the publish, publishing myself. <laughs> I organized it all myself. Self-publishing could or should mean that you've written your work. Uh, where possible, you might get professional help with it. 
you might get somebody to, to do the editing because you know once you've written something that's your starting point somebody else will probably find not just the mistakes that my great aunt found with my spelling and my grammar but will find how you can improve on your work and although you know editors will will differ you know and you can take it to three different editors and they will give you three different suggestions that's okay. The fact is that they will make suggestions and, and offer you ideas as to how to, to get it better, to make it something that would, people will read and be comfortable reading. And so you, you do that, and then you have to then worry about getting it uh, printed. As a self-publisher, you then have to worry about marketing it. So how do you get people to know about this book? All right? It's all up to you. The costs are yours, you know, unless you're sharing the cost with somebody else. So you you self-publish, as opposed to I'm just following up with our discussion. If that's okay, yes, uh, that's fine. An independent publisher, which means that they're not really associated with any of those big publishing firms or that right. that, that, that you know the, the people who kind of control things for a while, and there are lots of independent publishing houses. There's one that I know of here, and it's run by, by Flory Williams White, um, Moon Dancer, I think her publishing house is called. And but in the Caribbean, you have great publishing publishing houses like Caribbean Reads, organized uh, by Carol Mitchell. You know, you have um oh, Saint Martin. I'm not remembering the name. Saint Martin Press, I believe, is one. There may be others, and they have done some fantastic work, uh, you know. A gentleman named Seku there, he, he's done amazing work, as well as uh, Rhoda Arundel, a lecturer at the University of St. Martin. So, and, and other places, there's just good work, Caribbean work, and Ian Randall in Jamaica, now considered bigger than those small independent, because he's doing yes. lots of things. But, you know, everything is relative. So Ian Randall is small compared to Harper Collins. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, Caribbean Reads might right now be small compared to Ian Randall, but I know the Caribbean Reads is growing and I have a feeling that success will be theirs and they're doing fantastic work. In a few years, huh? Yeah, now and in and, and the future, but doing great, great work right now. She's got a number of fantastic, particularly children's books out. So if you want to have your children reading great books this summer, look for books written by or published through Caribbean Reads, you know, including uh, Joanne's work musical youth for teenagers uh, her book lost which is in english and in spanish you know they're they're published through caribbean reads and well available right now in antigua through best of books great is, is it that you decided from the start that you were going to do self-publishing or from your research you decided hmm, maybe i need to just self-publish okay i'm going to answer the, that question with this so when Harper Collins decided they were going to include some books in the Big Cat series of Antiguan books. They asked us to send in some, uh, like an outline type of thing. What, what's your idea, right? And I would have submitted, I think, about three of them. And uh, so one of those three, let's say, is here with us now, right? It's. I, I know that there are many other people who submitted ideas, and some of those ideas weren't didn't didn't get the the, the green light, at yes. least not right away. So it's not that you can always get into an international publisher or well-recognized publishing house because they have lots of people who want to be published by them, right? So the fact is that not everybody gets there. And so at times you will publish, especially if you're publishing for your own market. So both of these books that I've self-published have done pretty well in Antigua and Barbuda but they're not known of outside of Antigua and Barbuda, right? So, I, and I'm also fortunate I manage a bookstore. <laughs> so, you know, th th there is something to be said for having the books there and, you know, somebody comes in and says, I need something for so-and-so. And yeah, there are times when, you know, somebody working at the bookstore says, and that lady over there wrote that, and they go, oh, really? <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing sometimes, but um, it helps us. <laughs> It does. And so both books have done quite well, but again, we're talking well, not well that's going to, you know, support me, <laughs> you know, it, it, but, but well in terms of me knowing how many books would normally sell and recognizing that, yeah, okay, not bad. 
but unless I was, I, I don't have the contacts to get these books around the world. Whereas Turtle Beach now, you know, within a, within a, hopefully a few months, if you're in New Zealand, you can go to Amazon dot New Zealand, whatever it is called, and you can order Turtle Beach. You know, yes, I could put my self published books on Amazon as well. Yes, but 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 it's different, you know. So that that that's the whole thing, and independent publishers, yes, they will have their contacts as well. But um, and some have fantastic contacts. It all depends on on the work they're doing and how far, how long they've been around, who they've reached out to. But yeah, you know, if you if you have a few dollars, not a lot. Well, I mean, it takes it takes <laughs> to have access to, then you might try. But that's also a challenge. What we've seen, what I've seen as a, as a bookseller is I've seen fantastic books come and go, because a person can only afford to do the first print run and to make that even make sense financially, you probably have to produce about 200 books, maybe 500. Oh, if wow. you publish 500 books in Antigua and Barbuda, it's gonna take a while to sell them, generally speaking. Yes. So your money has been tied up there. This is the money you could be using to pay your rent or paying your mortgage or whatever it is, or sending your children to school. So you're investing in yourself and the returns may take a while, right? If it's published by an uh, international publishing company, it's your work and you're hoping that you're going to get some returns. Your returns will probably be smaller in terms of what they may last longer. Uh, but, but the chances of hitting it big <laughs> are, are, are bigger, still small, but they're bigger because at least the book is out there where people can see it. We haven't had a literary festival in a while. And I would so like to see Antigua have another literary festival. What are your thoughts on that? I think everything, everything literary should be happening. You know, yes. uh, the truth of the matter is that there are literary festivals around the region. <laughs> Our wonderful country often does things first, but we don't always keep it going. And, and so it takes a lot to have these sort of events. And in most countries where they are successful, it's a it's a partnership, you know. And it's yes. often fueled by places like like the Department of Culture or the, the Ministry of Culture or whatever that country calls it, you know. Our literary festivals have all have all been privately organized. And I would say funded. I know that the literary festival that was organized through Pam Atherton and her sister, I know that they did get uh, some thing from the government um, at some point. <laughs> but the, the, the main money would have come from private individuals. And organizing something like that is not easy. You know, the benefits to the country are, are great. It is. So, but, but it comes down to us us, the people who are in charge of us, understanding the value of it, you know? Maybe maybe the Department of Culture in association with the Public Library of Antigua and Barbuda should be kind of hosting this, because you have the space, whereas if I do it, I have to go and find the space to do, to do it, you know, and find the resources. Uh, one of our challenges in Antigua and Barbuda, and this would be the same challenge we had uh, <laughs> many years ago is as far as I know, I don't think there's anybody in the department or ministry of culture who is designated as the person responsible for literary arts. And I would have said this to a, a former minister of culture a couple of decades back. I would have said to him that in the same way that by putting a person in charge of, of PAN in the ministry or department of culture and she, Barbara Mason, along with others, would have done an amazing job of getting Pan back on his feet. Literary arts, it needs an advocate. It does. You it know, does. It needs an to, to get certain things done. Now, having said that, those of us who have pushed literary arts in Antigua and Barbuda over the years, we have had great success. You know, and I can measure the success in terms of the fact that, you know, <laughs> Later this month, I'm going to be working with someone who's launching a book in Antigua, living in New York, and she'll be launching her book here when she comes down. I know that uh, Ronan Matthew has just put out his book, and it sold out quickly. And 
so many people in our country are writing, you know, yes. and I would almost say more so than many other places. So even with the limited, or I'm gonna very bluntly say that the not enough support from the powers that be, we've done an amazing job of producing our own things. Imagine what would have happened if there was even more support out there. True. You know, the because when our local authors shine, Antigua shines. Exactly. But not not just that, you know, but I mean, the literary arts. So I'm right now doing a number of, of workshops, some creative writing workshops. And I have some with teenagers and some with adults, right? When you see people writing, you know, I had a lady last night speak about wanting to write for, for years, wanting to read her work and not being able to do it. And she's really happy to have joined this creative writing session and the confidence that she's gained through it. So this may not be a quote unquote academic subject, but everything doesn't have to be academic. Everything doesn't have to be whatever it is. We can learn in different ways. I've worked with students who are, they're going through things in their life and it is through writing yes. that they're able to, can I say bluntly, still be here? Yes. Because there have been thoughts of other things that by writing it down and writing through it. So why not give our, our people a skill that will help yes. us throughout life? Not all of us are going to have books published on a shelf. You know, that will happen for some. But writing is something that, that helps us in so many ways. And if we get our children and our adults writing, then who knows what can happen? You know, we, we swing back to a Dadley pen and with Dadley pen has been around for 18 years. 15 of those 18 years, there have been competitions of some sort, some having adults involved, some just children, but wh whatever, people writing. Some of those early writers of, of 18 years ago are now published authors. Some aren't, but it doesn't matter. You know, they had an opportunity to write. I want to see more of those opportunities in, in a more formal setting, you know, with, with people who, who know what they're doing and who have the time. You know, at one point I chaired the Independence Literary Arts Competition. And before I did that, Brenda Lee Brown had done it. We were volunteers. And the interesting thing about it was that when we sat in those independence planning meetings, most of the people in the room were people who were working for the government. We were the ones who were leaving our jobs uh, and coming to spend two, three hours in the planning session. Why is it that, I mean, to me, didn't anybody there take a look around and say, well, yeah, we have somebody responsible for dance and somebody responsible for music. And we're saying that literary arts is one of the arts forms mm -hmm. in the, in, that's important as we celebrate independence. But yet we don't have anybody who's employed by the government who we could have sit down here in this room with us. That just says something. And unfortunately, many, many different ministers of culture have passed through, many different directors of culture have passed through, and I'm yet to see any, <laughs> uh, you know, fill that gap, which sort of suggests perhaps, um, you know, where the literary arts are, are seen in our, in our country. And I, I hope that will change because there are so many talented people in this wonderful country of ours. There is, there is. So, there's so much more that can be done through literary arts. It's it's a money maker as well. There, there, it, it is. <laughs> it's something that's, that, that, that gives economic benefits in so many ways. People are writing to read the news. People are writing to yes. do things. So let's develop that creativity so we have a stronger community. Lots of discussion need to be held and that needs to be followed up by some action. There we go. I was about to say to you, discussion, yes, but some of us have been having this discussion for too long and those who can can get the action part of it going yes. need to step up now. Because, yes. you know, every now and again, somebody comes to me and says, we need to have a think tank about what to do. And I've stopped attending. I'm tired of talking. You want to know what I think? Go read the last report. <laughs> because nothing's changed. The last Understood. person there and said they, they were doing a study on behalf of so-and-so. Yeah, go read their report. My thoughts are there. <laughs> so so what year was our last literary art um, independence competition? Well, there are a number of things you're asking about there, so it's not just one thing, right? Okay. The independence literary arts competition, I mean, we have independence celebrations every year. Yes. And every now and again, in recent times, we've had something thrown in. We've had a competition where someone's going to win $5,000 or something like that. 
but in terms of something that's that's fully coordinated and and where people are are trained and offered assistance and where you have a full ceremony and all of that i'm not aware of one happening for the last i don't know 10 years easily right like i said not that nothing's been done years i think so i i think so probably close to that in terms of the independence um yes literary arts competition again there have been things happening so i don't want anybody to say to me oh no no i know one year when so and so things have happened but not in in the way that i personally think will be beneficial to our society in terms of the literary festival as i said which was organized for a few years to pam atherton and her sister joy of uh, baltimore um i mean that's been a long 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 time yes but, <laughs> Had, we would have had people like um, uh, Eric Jerome Dickey. Eric, who was yes, away. I remember. And, and fell in love with Antigua. Yes. And came here often and who was able to encourage other people to come to Antigua, you know, and, and who held workshops and training and who sat at my desk and signed books for people. Yes. You know, and who I, I bumped into one evening. He was sitting on the wall by by uh, Deluxe Cinema. And I somebody calls out to me and go, Eric? <laughs> <You know? laughs> celebrity but he loved coming here because he could just yes. be you know yes. and they may so rest in peace but um yes. you know and there's so many other people like that so that literary those literary festivals that they organize you know invaluable really but it's too much to ask private sector to do it entirely on their own yes right? agreed we, we need agreed. to recognize the value and and, and push that from other other places and then of course you have like the best of books and we've had different literary events you know so we would have had uh, something um honoring i think joanne's book really dancing nude in the moonlight where we would have had uh, a dance i can't remember what it was called but it was a, a festival so to speak and it was out on on the road and we had all sorts of things associated with it and with the idea of moonlight we had someone oh. from the we, we, we did a bartender's competition to come up with a moonlight drink or something and all sorts of things. Cause again, cr you know, creativity is creativity. We had dancers, we had musicians and it was just a fantastic evening of literary celebration. You know, we've also had a few events that we held in the parking lot at ACB across the road from the best of books. Yes. And ACB has always said, yes, if we ask, they say yes. <laughs> And we thank them for that, recognizing, you know, as, as a as a local, now regional institution, they're willing to support and always have been. But again, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we have to find a way to pay for a big tent over the road. We have to go and beg the police uh, who have to try to figure out who, who we are again, what you want, what is that? We're as opposed to, you know, Christian call from the- That sounds from, like a library activity. <laughs> right, if, 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 but no, but I mean, if, if Miss Christian calls from the public library, <laughs> you want that, 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 that oomph and- the No. Will, <laughs> or somebody calls from the Department of Culture and says, we are doing such and such, you want to then hope that there's a bit more uh, understanding yes. of it's not just a little something, you know? And yeah, so again, I'm rambling on, but I think you understand no, that. Needed discussion, needed discussion, needed discussion, needed discussion. So it's we all need a discussion. On our calendar, just as we have other things, it needs to be there and it needs to be yes. led by, by people who can lead it. There must be yes. some person out there sitting down at the desk who doesn't like what they're doing. They'd much rather work in the Department of Culture as the literary representative and they can organize workshops throughout the year and they can do different things and and that's not saying they have to do the workshop themselves they then have to coordinate and there has to be a budget and they have to hire joanne hillhouse to conduct a workshop or barbara arundel or brenda lee brown or 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 whoever you know but it has to be important enough that we're willing to pump some money we're not saying a fortune but some money into to developing this aspect of who we are as, as a literary society. And True. we have a great history as, as uh, you know, as far as education is concerned, writing. They've been writers in Antigua and Barbuda from get go. And I mean, I mean, people who've been writing and doing well, a, a guy who left Barbuda um, as, a, as a son of an enslaved woman, and he became a, a, a brilliant, well-known author in, in Europe in the 17, 
1700s, right? So, you know, even those stories that we don't know about, it is named to be retold. They have to be retold. But you see, that's where, you know, if we had events where we were, for example, so you get someone like me to encourage people to write historic stories, you know, you get someone like, I don't know who to write romance stories, uh, you know, because you have um, uh, Michel Toussaint who, you know, writes various things. So there are lots of people who can do it, you know, and in my opinion, whatever you can, whatever you know how to do, you can teach somebody else to some degree, at least. So you move it forward. And that's what I'd like to see happening in the, the world of literary arts in Antigua yes. and Barbuda. <laughs> true, true. You know, because a lot of um, individuals pass through the library and they ask questions like those also. And they, they, they ask about publishing and publishers or I have this work that, you know, um, I'd like somebody to look at. And you probably send them, send them down to me, don't you? Because they often end up at, at, at the bookstore and I don't have much <laughs> to tell them. But, you know, if, if what it's worth, though, I, 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 a little BS has, has um, told me that uh, Ricky Camacho at the uh, copy, I'm not sure what her office is called, copyright um, office, Yes. There should be a workshop coming on soon. I'm, I'm, I'm letting things out the bag probably, but letting all of the, the writers and the people who want to know more about publishing, that that office will be organizing something to help us all know how to go about publishing our work and, and securing our copyright and all of these things that we want to know, we should know. You know? And obtaining your ISBN numbers because somebody that, said that. they thought the library provided the ISBN numbers, and we're like, hmm, we need to look into that because well, yeah. it's been more than one. Yes, right. Because in some places you can. So I mean, you know, hopefully that will be a starting point. Because yeah, you know, why not? To me, yes, I'd love to see the library more involved. You know, I, I mean, I know you guys have your your, your plate full of, of various things and and the restrictions that you have as well, but. You know, there are things that can be done. And I know you guys mean well. This is a fantastic thing you're doing here with this author of the month that's been going on for quite some time now. And I mean, the many other things that I see online. So you guys are working hard to prove that the library is, is still relevant, very, very relevant. It is. You guys have, you know, you, you've changed with the times. You know, you're not just doing it the way it always was done. And that's what libraries do. Good, good. I mean, for what it's worth, you know, Antigua and Barbuda lacked a library, a, a complete library for a long, long time, you know, and I, I try to be truthful and honest. And so, um, you know, I would have grown up with, with Mrs. Mayers as a librarian upstairs there off Market Street. And, you know, the, the, the child of me thought that was what a library was until I went somewhere else and realized that, no, that was a room with, with books in it. Yep. <laughs> and... So now that we have the, the fantastic building that you have there, um, you know, once the library becomes then that community space, you know, once yes. you're open longer hours. My yeah. aunt was 82. She was, she was a librarian in, in the building at the bottom of High Street in the late 60s. And she said to me, yeah, the library used to be open until, I think she told me, 9 o'clock, uh, a few days a week, not every day. But it was seen as a place where people... In, around, in and around St. John's could come and do some research. Of course, research then meant opening books and getting information. Yes. But the library was a community place at that point in time, in, in the 60s, the 1950s and 60s. You know? So we want to see again, you know, those who are responsible for making sure that you guys are, are compensated for being there later. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, you, you know, um, pre-COVID, we operated until seven. Okay, great, great, great. But and then I, from COVID, we've gone back to five. Right. And I mean, although I applaud that, I, I do want us to, I want to see the library open much later. Be because, <laughs> oh, you see, <laughs> I mean, if, if my aunt can tell me. No, that, I understand that, you know. I, I, I'm just already imagining the conversation. I also remember um, Kwame Apata, who taught at. at ah, yes. Queen. I remember him saying to me that he was a student at the University of Guyana. I'm not sure that's the full name of the university. And they had a sit-in because the library was closing at 10 o'clock each night and the students needed more time. And I mean, he was talking about when he was a student, right? Wow. 
so so that, that I mean we have to put those things in context and recognize that our library being open until seven is not sufficient. It's better than I, I, I understand that. And, and of course, it's a shift in thinking. So it, to me, it then means that the library should have a, 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 a some people who work at the open at nine. Am I right? So some people work work nine to five, but others who work from 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 I don't know from three to. Oh, that's to how it's done to get us to seven. Okay, so but, but now it's moving to ten or eleven. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I I tend to think is as the need arises. But there's the other side of that, you know, if, if you're if you're there, then because you know, we sometimes think that all of our students have access to the internet or have access to computers. True, true. And I, I know they don't because even at the bookstore, there are so many students who come in there to utilize this, the few systems that we have. Yes. You know, and not all of them can afford to, to do what they need to do. True. So, you know, if if, if a place like the library is I mean open, the same thing happens here. Yeah. 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 So if if people know and even see if you have access, some people want a quiet place, you know, because there are many households. So even right now, uh, you know, I've heard students, there's students who come into the bookstore. We can't keep them there now because we can't have too many people in the room. Yes. And there's, you know, one, one guy says, just let me stay half an hour. It's six of us in the house and everybody there. <laughs> he just doesn't want to go home because he yes. wants a quiet yes. place for his homework. To concentrate. Yes. You know? And so hopefully the library can and should be that. And to me, if you know, if you build it, they'll come. But you built it. <laughs> if if the doors are open more often, I, I do think that more people agreed. Can... Agreed. Yeah. Yes. But, yes. Not, not you guys. I think you're doing a great oh, job. No. I just want to see even more available to us as a community. So we True. can just to grow and be even better as people. And then we require feedbacks like this, you know, to help us to plan ahead. So we always look forward to the comments, okay. whether positive, <laughs> whether positive or negative. We need to hear it, okay? I hope we might fall somewhere between, or you know, <laughs> <laughs> just supportive. That's all. That's what I want. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Supportive of us doing more where we can. Yes. Um. Well, we are kind of running out of time. Maybe we need a part two. <laughs> <laughs> I know we didn't get a chance to hear anything of turtle beach. Yes. Do we want to or do we have time or not really? We oh. have about five or ten minutes. Five to okay. ten minutes. All right. So shall I? Yes, please. Right. So again, not starting at the beginning, but jumping right into the middle. Quickly, the lights were turned off. The bright full moon made it possible to still see the turtles. Together, they had looked like a giant sea creature. But now, Anais saw that there were more than 100 tiny turtles. She almost cried with excitement. Anais wondered where their parents were. Don't all babies need adults to protect them? When the lights went off, the turtles stopped suddenly. For more than a minute, not one of them moved. What has happened to them? Anais cried. Then, as suddenly as they had stopped, they all turned around. It was magical to be there, to see this happening. With the moon in front of them, an army of baby turtles made their way towards the sea. Everyone in the restaurant clapped. Some even cried as they realized what had just happened. By turning off the light, they had saved the lives of the baby turtles. Everyone in the restaurant had stood up to watch the turtles. Some people wanted to rush out and help. The lady said that they shouldn't. She explained that the baby turtles knew what to do. Picking up the turtles can harm them, she explained. We need to let them follow the moonlight back to the sea. A few might need a hand. Once most of the turtles were safely in the water, she said she would check that none were trapped. And I'm gonna skip a page or two and, okay. and, and just say, and read this part, because I think it's important. As they walked along the beach, they saved a few turtles that hadn't made it to the water. One had been caught in a cup. Another couldn't free itself from a plastic bag. Oh, wow. And I used to realize that the garbage had almost killed the baby turtles. From now on, she was going to remind everyone that they shouldn't litter. So the story, 
yeah, you know, the story is hopefully helping our little people to know that not just turtles are, are, are fantastic things, but that we have the power to help them. Yes. And I've been doing some readings with some schools. I, I, I read and, and I've had some wonderful environmentalists with me reading along. Uh, Natalia here in Antigua, we read to the students in Barbuda. And uh, Stephanie, who is a, a, a from St. Kitts, I read to the Adventist School in St. Kitts by Zoom, of course. Oh, wow. And you know, I discovered that we need our turtles because turtles eat jellyfish. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Thank nothing, you. nothing ruins my swim, and I love to swim like jellyfish. Yes. So I would much rather us save the turtles so the turtles can get rid of the jellyfish. I know everything serves a purpose, but I don't know the purpose of jellyfish. <laughs> so, uh, let, let's save a few more turtles. Let's be aware of them. Let's uh, be careful with their eggs. Let's not litter on the beach. I mean, for so many reasons. We think we're not littering because it looks bad. We're not littering because, you know, creatures like turtles and fish and, and, and all these right. other creatures of the sea can get hurt, including human yeah. creatures can get hurt when we litter. I I, I can so appreciate that. Woo, I love that book. Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, is this the 21, 2021 and forward birthday book, Christmas book? That's a good gift right there. Thank you. Or just that. because book. Just because, yes. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, all of us as Antiguans and Barbudans, we should be collecting Antigua and Barbudan books. So, yes. you know, when, when when this one, Legend of Bats came and other stories came out, people asked me, who's it for? And I, I said, it really is for everybody because there were adults who were buying it. I mean, their only complaint was it's too short. Uh, there were teenagers who were learning something about our heritage and, and people who are reading the stories to their smaller children. So they would also learn a bit about our culture and who we are. So, you know, books like these, not just the ones yes. that I have associated with, but all of our books, you know, everybody should have to shoot hard labor in their house. Yes. Everybody should have, you know, their, their young, their young people reading, um, the boy from Willow Bend, everybody who has any interest in their spirituality should be collecting, um, uh, Miss Simon's books, you know, um, the uh, lemon tree. Kessa. Uh, yes, the she's written those are awesome books. You know, again, Joy Lawrence, the way we yes. talk, the way we, right? You know, and other things. Learn about Bethesda. Bethesda is celebrating the 29th of May because formal education for us, the average Antiguan and Barbudan, started on the 29th of May, in 1813, in in on land in a building that would eventually be called Bethesda. And so that's being celebrated this year, 29th of, of May. And a great place to learn more about Bethesda is in Joy Lawrence's book. Yes. Bethesda and Christian Hill. So we're teaching through our books and we're also allowing everybody to have fun. Get away, you know, just let your imagination take you somewhere. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I like I, I love our local books and I'm sure um other individuals that get the opportunity would feel the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So some old books that need to get back be, be put back into print, you know? Yes. And some of them are available. Um I have access to what well, no you do? <laughs> uh, the book a book written by Brian Dye, The History of Antigua. Um a, 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 yes. I I'm just trying to get it back in print. Um, it's an expensive process to do, but um, if anybody wants to <laughs> to work with me to get it done, but I think that and we're one of the few islands in, in the Caribbean where there is not a complete history book available. Mm -hmm. That book went out of print. Um, we don't have time for anything. Right. But um, I'm curious as to if that's a book that we have. I'm sure you have it. It's a blue book history. Uh, yes, we do. We do. A short, a short history. Yes. It's called. Yes. But you can't buy it anymore because it's out of print. And ah, 
Okay. It, it should have been included in the school system. You know, the books that Brian died wrote for many other Caribbean islands. Lots of information. Yes. They, they became part of what the, the school system em embraced and said, well, we'll get these for our third formers, fourth formers, whichever formers, but we in Antigua and Barbuda, we didn't go down that route. So our book became out of print because publishers. But then, but then when they come for the research, that's one of the books we go to. It is, but I mean, luckily for them, there's a library. See how valuable you are? Because they're not in a position to buy it for themselves right now. But it shouldn't just be for the students. Everybody should have a book Everybody. library. Everybody, yeah. You know, at, but they should have also had access to it in the classroom. Because the students in, in St. Kitts and Montserrat, other places, the book that he wrote, they're still able to get it because the publisher reprinted it. Because the schools are buying it. Right. It was a constant flow. So that's how we have to understand, you know, supporting something makes it available. We didn't do that here, but hopefully if it is reprinted, I'm hoping that maybe the school system will- Will uh, utilize it. Yeah. You know, and individuals that will come into the reference section of the library, mm -hmm. where we have all our West Indian collection, mm -hmm. you know, when they ask, well, where can I purchase a copy? Where do you think we send them? And I appreciate that so much. <laughs> <laughs> I really am doing my best. That it's always a pleasure to do that. Yeah, we appreciate it. We do appreciate yes. it. I mean, you know, the, the bookstore is, is less of a business, mainly because it's not doing that well anyway. Then it is a it is a well. That's that's that's, well. that's a discussion that that I wanted us to enter into, but um, we didn't get there. But I rambled on about other things today. I'm no. <laughs> so what was important, you know? We came ahead, came ahead. It's all right. Um, so we are so happy that we got this time to sit and talk. I know you're a very busy individual. So we are so happy that, you know, you actually took the time and have, it's a wonderful discussion. And I hope that some of the things that we discuss will finally come to fruition. I hope so. I hope so. And thank yes. you so much for the opportunity yes. to be with you. It's been a pleasure. And keep keep up the good work. Keep doing what you do because you're Thank making you. a big difference. You really are. There are people who are better off because you guys are there and because you're doing what you do. And I hope more people will visit the library in a safe way right now. But yes. will benefit from what you have available to all of us. So thanks. Thank you. And we wish you much success in all of your endeavors. Appreciate that. All right. So... On behalf of the library, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us. We've been speaking with Miss Barbara Arundel, and I hope that we get the chance to do this again. <laughs> anytime, anytime. Happy to be there. Right. And so um, for those looking for books, always go down to the Best of Book Bookstore. I mean, she's always there and willing to help you. <laughs> All right. Bye. So thank you once again, and everybody, and Miss Arundel, until we speak again. Thank you. Thank you as well. Have a wonderful right. day. All Thank you. All right. All the best. Bye.